Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing today? Good to see you all here. I hope you've had a wonderful week. Now we've got autumn setting in uh, very quickly. It's a nice, brisk day outside. Thankfully, it's not too cold in here. Uh, but with all these wonderful faces here, no wonder it's warm. So let us all stand and worship the Lord together. We'll start off on 207. We have come to join in worship. We have come to join in worship. Hymn 207. 207. We have come to join in worship and adore the Lord our God. Let us come in prayer expecting God to speak His mighty words. All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Christians pray and only man will be showered all around. See them gathered all around you. See he brought a grim cross. See the weary, see the hurting, see the lowly, see the lost. Be his hand and touch the needy. Be his gospel, let it sound. Be his body and sweet manna will be showered all around. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us care all God makes all things new. Christ will call us home to heaven. At his banquet we'll sit down. Christ himself will rise and serve us, living man all around. Amen. Amen. Such wonderful singing this morning. Now let us turn to 79. Jesus, I love thee. 79. Jesus, I love thee. <clears throat> My Jesus, I love thee for thou art forth in mansions of glory and in blessed delight I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright I'll find with the glittering crowns on my brow if ever I love thee, my Jesus, till now. Well, good morning this morning. It is great to see you here at Truth Baptist Church. You should all be alive, alert, awake, enthusiastic. You had that extra hour of sleep. How many truly benefited from that extra hour? How many are more tired than you were before? All right, very good. And uh, I hope it helped you, but we're glad to be together today. Hey, listen, it might feel a little chilly in here this morning, and uh, believe it or not, the heat is not working great, but all the hot air that we just sang with, it kind of helped the room, you know? So um, if it's a little chilly, we got the heat getting worked on, we should have it fixed by tomorrow. And uh, it was actually blowing out cold air on Wednesday night, and. Uh, again, during the week, as some ladies were here helping with the 
uh, Operation Christmas Child boxes, and so we've decided just to turn it completely off. And you might even feel hot by the time the service is over, especially once the preaching is finished, right? I'm glad you're here, whether you're here for the first time or whether you've been here for a long time. Uh, it's always good to be together, and uh, it's, it's a blessing to have several people who are here. Uh, good to see some of our college students back. Good to see Spencer and uh, brought his friend from college as well. And, uh, and they're just, uh, they just came through midterms, so he said, we're taking some time to rest. And that's a good idea sometimes in college to rest a little bit. And then do I see Kendall back there? All right, Kendall is here, one of our longtime youth group members who's now grown up and married and uh, just living uh, her best life now, right? And uh, we're glad anytime we have a former youth group member who's here. Terry Sullivan is here, not, not Hanover County Terry Sullivan, but Truth Baptist Terry Sullivan is here. And uh, Terry, as you know, he was the first guy I met when I moved to Mechanicsville here over 17 and a half years ago. He found my number somehow and he, he, he tracked me down. And he called me up and he said, I heard you're starting a church. And I said, yeah. And he goes, I want to talk to you. And I thought, uh-oh, I don't know if that's good or bad. And uh, I went over to where Carolyn's Gardens was and uh, on his uh, acreage and his house there and met Terry. And it, it was a great meeting. And from day one, since we started Truth Baptist, Terry was our head usher until he decided to move away to Georgia. And, uh, and so he's down in Georgia, but Terry, you look just as great as ever. And uh, Terry, just, he just keeps on going. He just, he just takes a lick and keeps on ticking. Nothing can keep him down. We're glad to have you here today. It feels special to have you. And, uh, and then speaking of Georgia, we have Trent here for his last service. He's gonna be leaving down to go to boot camp in Georgia uh, tomorrow. So we're glad that he's here. We'll have a word of prayer over him at the end of the service, but I'm so thankful to, to have Trent here one last Sunday. Speaking of first uh, service and having people from the beginning, Trent was uh, someone in that role as well. And uh, whether it was knocking on doors, meeting people, giving the gospel, uh, he always was my right-hand man. And so it's a bittersweet day for us. We're glad he's going down to the Army and moving on with what God wants him to do. But it's also something that's a bit sad for our family, but we're glad he's here as well. So kind of a special day to see some familiar faces. And, uh, and if you are here for the first time, again, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on this service together. Lord, we thank you for this time to come together and pray and to look into your word together this morning. We pray that you would speak to hearts. We ask that you would use this service in a, in a helpful way to so many here. Lord, we're speaking about some end time events yet again today, but we pray that it would become very practical for all who are here. And I pray that you would take what might sometimes seem like abstract eschatological truth and, and use it in the here and now to speak directly to us. And Lord, that's what we want to help uh, people with and we want to see accomplished. We want to see people draw closer to you. And so I ask that there be clarity this morning, be with the continuation of the service through the singing and, and, and the preaching and all that will happen here today. We do thank you and we love you. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to have one more prayer, believe it or not. Uh, you see these boxes up here, Operation Christmas Child. Um, all of these boxes are just about full. And uh, there was actually some smaller items that we were thinking we needed for these boxes. They have been provided. We have 102 Operation Christmas Child boxes that means there'll be 102 young people throughout our world somewhere who will receive not only a christmas but they'll also receive the gospel praise the lord for that and i'm just so thankful that we have a church that makes that a priority 102 boxes seems like a lot for a church our size but you've done it and you've filled these boxes and uh, what a blessing that is to be able to know that these boxes are going somewhere where they need to go and uh, so I'm going to have one more prayer. I want to pray over these boxes, and then we'll continue on with the service. Father, we pray as well for these Operation Christmas Child boxes. We ask that, uh, Lord, you would have your hand on all of them. Thank you for the preparation and the people in our church who have bought items and filled them. Thank you for the packing party that happened here yesterday. And then, Lord, we ask that you would um, use the gospel tracks that will go on the top of each of these boxes 
and as they're open, that not only will young people be excited about the gifts that they get, but that they'll receive the gospel. And that if there is someone that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, as they open that box, that they would trust in you once and for all for salvation. Father, we pray the same thing here today. If there's someone here who's never trusted in you for salvation, I pray that they would make that decision today. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. If you, <clears throat> if you are visiting here for the first time today, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you for making it a priority to come and to be a part of our service here this morning. As our ushers make their way down the aisle, you can just go ahead and briefly put your hand up. We want to give to you a visitor welcome card <coughs> and a pen. And uh, just fill out that visitor welcome card. And at the end of the service, you can hand it to myself or you can put it in the offering plate as they come by. My wife, Heather, and I will be out in the lobby after the service. We'd love to have the opportunity to meet you and say hello if we've not done so already. And again, you're our honored guest today, so thank you for being here. We hope you feel welcome. We want you to know you're amongst friends, and we're so glad to have you here uh, with us today. As our ushers make their way back up, let me just mention a couple of things. The bulletin has a lot in there, but don't forget, uh, this Tuesday is a pretty important day. It is Election Day, and... Uh, I'm encouraging everybody to go to the polls and let's do our civic duty and uh, before God and country and let's vote. Uh, the Lord has given you a vote. Don't waste it. Don't squander it. Go to the polls and do so. Uh, early voting has become more and more a thing and uh, it is happening everywhere. It's a matter of right, for, right here in Hanover County. Early voting has been happening for weeks now. And uh, how many uh, have already early voted? I'm just curious. Okay, good number of you. That's great. Uh, if you are 18 or older and you're registered to vote, and I tr pray and trust that you are, uh, you can vote and do so on Tuesday. Don't let Tuesday pass before you've done your job. So uh, let's make sure that as God's people, we're going to the polls. And here's what I always say. I honestly never have endorsed a candidate here. And I mean that. I've never endorsed a single candidate. But here's what I always endorse. Voting biblical values if we vote what we know God's word stands on we'll never vote wrong uh, someone might have an R a D or an I or something else next to their name and they may or may not be the right person to vote for but if you know the issues and you vote and you vote biblical values you'll know you'll vote exactly as God wants you to vote so let's be sure we do that and I want to encourage you in that this week uh, we're in the month of November now which means there's uh, several exciting things on the horizon. Uh, we do have our Mechanicsville Christmas Parade coming up. The gospel cards that we'll be giving out should be coming uh, in the mail this week. And we already have 5,000 candy canes. Once we get those 5,000 gospel cards, we'll tape those candy canes to the cards. And the Christmas float is being built as we speak. And uh, there's something very exciting about the float this year, and you'll just have to, you'll have to wait and see what it's all about. But uh, it is coming together, right, Margaret? Right, Chris? All right. These two are on it, and others helping as well. And uh, I'm excited about the Christmas float this year. It is one of the biggest events in Mechanicsville. Thousands of people line up a one-mile course. It, it's, a, it's a ripe opportunity to give the gospel and invite people to church and really... Uh, I can't think of a better way to reach so many people at one time than to do that. Here's what we need. We need people to check out the sign-up sheet in the back, and there's still some areas to sign up for. But we especially need walkers that will walk with the float. Uh, not everybody can ride on the float, although we still need some help there. But we especially need, I'd say, even as many as 50 people, 25 on each side, handing out gospel invitations with a candy cane. You can't throw them at the crowd, okay? Sorry, I know that you, you probably like to just like throw. I would like to do that, but they don't allow that at the parade. But you can hand anything to anyone uh, so long as it's legal, right? And, uh, and the gospel's not been outlawed yet, so we're going to give that with a candy cane to people. And uh, so we're encouraging as many people as possible. We want to walk alongside the float. We'll have some live music, it looks like, with the float. We're having a, a, a big build out that we've built this year that you'll have to see. And, uh, and then we need some people who will ride on the float in different caricatures 
uh, about the nativity. So just a lot of a lot of neat things that we're doing. We also have our uh, praise and pie night happening, and that's going to happen in a couple of weeks from now. And then come back tonight because we have a church planter, a young man, Nathaniel Ensley and his family, who are starting a brand new church down towards southern Virginia. And uh, I'm excited to hear from him tonight. So be here for the 6 o'clock service as well. We'll collect the offering now. And uh, Brother John, would you pray for the offering, please? Amen. Thank you very much for that, Holly. That was a blessing. And now let us turn to, to 92. Uh, 92, oh, how I love Jesus. 92, oh, how I love Jesus. Please be standing. Please stand. Please stand. There is a name I love to hear. I love to see his word. Earth, it sounds like you. In my ear, the sweetest on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! 
the fourth. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, and who sorrow bears a part that none has made below. Oh, how I love Jesus, so oh, how I love Jesus, so oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. And now it's November, we have a new chorus of the month, and that chorus is, I am forever grateful. Uh, the hymn number is 173, but it should also be on the bulletin this morning, uh, and it should be on the back wall as well. So 173, I am forever grateful. Uh, we'll sing the verse, refrain, and then greet one another. You did not wait for me to draw near to you. Oh, their self and frail humanity. You did not wait for me to cry out to you. So you nearly give your voice calling me. I'm forever grateful to you. I'm forever grateful for the cross. I'm forever grateful. Please turn and greet one another.
You did not wait for me to draw near to you, but you clothed yourself in frail humanity. You did not wait in fortune cry out to you, but you let me hear your voice calling me, and I'm forever grateful to you. I'm forever grateful for the cross. I'm forever grateful to you that you came to seek and save the lost. All right. Thank you. You can be seated, young people. Kindergarten up through sixth grade can be dismissed to go downstairs. And we are going to be in Matthew chapter number 25. Matthew chapter number 25. I've been mysteriously seeing these nickels show up on my uh, pulpit, just nickels. I know people thought I was poor or they wanted to <laughs> give me some loose change. And then, uh, Greg, what, was, what did these stand for again? Nickel defense. nickel defense. So if you pray for your pastor, you can put a nickel on here. If you pray once a day for your pastor for five days, you can put a nickel on the pulpit. And I promise I will not pocket these nickels. We'll put them back in the offering, okay? But uh, I really like that. I've never heard of that before. But whoever decided to do that and start putting nickels up here, um, I like that. And uh, so the nickel defense is in place. And uh, so we appreciate your prayers for that. And uh, so thank you for doing that. For a while I was confused as to what was going on. But uh, we'll take it. Very good. Matthew chapter 25, we're going to begin reading in verse 31 as we continue through the Gospel of Matthew. There the Bible says, beginning in verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations. He shall separate them one from the other, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungred, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, and as much as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. I want to preach for a few moments about this, the judgment of the nations. Now, we might hear a title like this and say, okay, we're into another end times message. 
how is this going to apply? And I have prayed that the Lord would help me to take this message and apply it to us because I believe there's some very helpful applications for us. And so let's ask the Lord's help this morning. We'll pray and then we'll take a few moments to consider this passage together. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this time together. We pray that you would uh, speak to us, be with this service. I pray that you would clear aside distractions, whether it be the temperature of the room or my voice or uh, just other things that are occupying our minds or our hearts. I just pray that you would help us to focus in and see the truth directly from your word that you'd have us to see. And I pray that it would be helpful for us. I ask that we would consider what's to come. There are some big things yet to come here that are going to happen in our world. And I pray that we would think about those things. But most importantly, I pray that we would know where our eternity is. And that we would know for certain that if we were to die today, that heaven would be our home. Help us to know that and have that settled. Thank you for friends, old and new, who are here today. Some familiar faces that we've known for many, many years. Others for just a short time. Some for the first time today. But Lord, may this message resonate with all of us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the text of today's message, we come to the final portion of Christ's Olivet Discourse, where we see him concluding with the foretelling of his final order of business before he is to begin his millennial reign. What will he do? Well, we know that he will righteously judge those who have lived through the Great Tribulation and are alive after the battle of Armageddon before ruling and reigning on earth for a thousand years. Now, I said a lot there and I tried to condense it, but as we think about end times, there are a number of events that are going to take place that have yet to happen. We've already studied this, so I'll briefly summarize. The first thing that's going to happen is the rapture. That is, when Jesus Christ returns, he'll stay in, in, in the air, but he'll, he'll rapture out the saints when he comes at that time. By that I mean those of us who are still alive and have trusted and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ are going to be taken right out of this world. We're going to disappear. The word rapture is not found in the Bible, but the concept and the understanding of it is very clear. Uh, there will be a catching away. So at some point that we don't know in the future, it could be any time, it could be in the next few moments, Christ is going to come unannounced, and he's going to take out the saved of this world. As you continue to see movie previews that are forthcoming and the next motion picture of aliens invading and people being uh, taken right out of this world, I think it's all in preparation for what's actually going to take place. It won't be aliens coming to take us out. It's going to be Jesus coming to take the saved out. Then what will happen is there will be a seven-year period of time immediately after that rapture known as the tribulation. And this will be a time of judgment here on earth like this world has never seen. During that time of judgment, the saved who have been either resurrected from their graves or have been taken right out of this earth will be going through a time of judgment called the Bema Seat Judgment with the Lord Jesus, not in this world, but uh, uh, before the throne of God. That'll happen for seven years. At the end of those seven years, those of us who are with the Lord, who have been saved, who have been receiving our proper judgment for seven years will then come back to earth with the Lord. He's going to be on a white stallion. He's going to have a vesture dipped in blood. And this time he's not coming to earth touching down as the suffering servant. He's coming as the conquering king. And the Bible makes it clear that when he comes back to earth, it's going to be like a sword of judgment that comes out of his mouth because when he returns, there will be armies that will be gathered together at Armageddon. It's an area in the Middle East. Isn't it surprising that all the focus now is coming back to the Middle East again? 
that that's where history will continue to move forward in that place. And uh, that which has yet to come is going to happen there uh, at the Valley of Megiddo in that battle named Armageddon. And as the armies of the world have come together to fight against the Lord, he's going to speak the spoken word and immediately they will be destroyed. It'll be that quick and it'll be that fast. At the end of that battle, then we enter into the millennial 1,000 year reign of Christ where those who have been saved will rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ as he is in his proper place on the throne in Jerusalem, ruling and reigning for a thousand years. Now, we have to understand, there will be some people who will live through that seven-year tribulation time. And there will be some people who will not be at Armageddon who will be uh, done away with. There's going to be a number of people throughout the world who will live into the millennial reign of Christ. They will all be people who are saved or those children under the age of accountability, but they will live and make their way into the millennial reign of Christ, and they will have to make a decision about Christ at some point during that 1,000-year reign of the Lord. And before that happens, he's going to gather all those who are still alive from the four winds of the earth, and he's going to have a judgment called the judgment of the nations. This will not be the judgment that we went through during the Bema Seat judgment. It will not be the great white throne judgment that happens for all those who have rejected Christ. And that will take place at the end of the thousand year reign. This will be a judgment of the nations of those still alive at the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ, at the end of Armageddon, at the end of the tribulation. Now, I've said a lot, and I'm not trying to confuse anybody. Maybe you've not studied a lot of end time events but I'm summarizing this to help us with a few things so that we can properly understand this passage. What can we learn and apply then from what we've just read here? And I wanna just give you several thoughts. Here's the first one. Number one, everyone, and I mean everyone, will one day face the Lord in judgment. Nobody escapes. Now, if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, here's the great news. You're not going to be judged for your sin. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that when we have confessed our sin to God and we've trusted in him for salvation, he puts our sins as far as the east is from the west. Uh, by the way, that's an infinite line. It keeps going. So our sins are as far as the east is from the west. He buries them in the depths of the sea. As one of my good uh, preachers that I looked up to growing up, Johnny Pope, he said, and he would put a sign on the top of that sea that says, no fishing here. Uh, our sins are done away with. He chooses not to remember them anymore. I am so thankful for that. Amen. That I'm not going to have my sin brought back before me. But we will be judged for our works for what we did or didn't do and whether it was profitable or unprofitable. Every believer is going to have that time of judgment at that Bema seat of the Lord Jesus Christ during that seven years. And then at the end of the millennial reign, all those who have rejected Christ and have died and have been in hell, he's going to bring back and he's going to judge them for what they did before they're cast into the lake of fire. You might say, that's not a pleasant thought, Pastor. I know, but it's in the word of God and I must preach what God's word says. Those who reject Christ meet their eternity separated from God forever in a place called hell. And that will be their judgment. But then this judgment of the nations takes place, and it just reminds us of something. Nobody escapes judgment. It doesn't matter if you live through the tribulation and make it into the millennial kingdom and live in that time. It doesn't matter if you've already trusted in Christ and are saved or if you've rejected it. Christ and gone to hell, everybody will have their moment where they stand before God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And that tells me that there's going to come a moment where every one of us will stand before the righteous judge Jesus, and we will give an account 
for what we've done. Now, I'm not proud of this, but I have had a few moving violations. That means driving tickets in my lifetime, okay? And, uh, and I have, because of that, actually gone to court on a number of occasions. And uh, I don't know if it's still over 80 miles per hour and it's considered reckless. Has that changed or is it still? Okay. 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 All right. Our resident trooper has broken it down for us. Just don't speed past him. He doesn't, matter, doesn't care. He doesn't care if you come to church here. He'll give you a ticket too. So, um, but anyway, listen, um, one time I was driving, I think, 81, 82 miles per hour. And I was on my way to a hospital visit. It was for a good reason. But I was still speeding. And I got pulled over by a state trooper. And I promise you, he looked like he was about 12 years old. And I think it was literally like the first stop he had ever made. He, the first guy he ever pulled over. He pulled me over. And he came to the driver's side window. And I kid you not, he told me, do you know how fast you were going? I said, no, I do not. He said, you were actually going over 80 miles per hour. That's reckless. And then after he said that, he put his hand on his gun. Almost like, what are you going to say to what I just said? And I started thinking to myself, do I look that dangerous, number one? Do I look angry? Am I that threatening? And he put, <laughs> Brooke says, yes, you are that threatening. Uh, <laughs> put his hand on his gun, and he said, let me see your license and registration. I gave it to him, and I thought, please, Lord, it's, I, I was going to see someone in the hospital. Please, Lord, please let him let me off, and he did not, and he came back, and he said, you have to appear in court in this date, and it's because it's reckless driving. You have to come, so I went, and I actually, uh, I met Craig Davis, and, uh, or Craig Evans, and uh, he's the lawyer, well-known lawyer, lawyer here in Mechanicsville. And anyone said, if you need someone to represent you in court, go see Craig Evans. So I went and saw Craig Evans, and uh, he and I talked for a long time about a number of things. And, and he went and he stood before me, and I said, how much is it going to cost me for you to represent me in court for this reckless driving? And he said, well, usually I'd, I'd, I'd pay, I, I'd request about 1000 bucks, but for you, I'm going to give you a freebie here. I said, yes, that's great. And I can remember going and standing before the judge. And I have stood before a judge on a couple of other occasions after this. But every time I have stood before the judge, I have in my mind something that I think I'm going to say. Judge, you don't understand. This trooper here, I mean, he was not good to me. Or you have to understand, I was making a hospital visit. And, um, you know, I really should be let off and all this kind of thing. And I remember telling... Uh, the lawyer, I, this, I, I really would like these things to be said. He said, oh, no, oh, no, you say nothing. You be quiet, and I will do the talking. And uh, Craig Evans, if you know him, sometimes he even fills in as a judge in juvenile court and everything else. He's well-known around here. And uh, we went in, and he stood before me. He said, now, you sit there and be quiet, and I'll do the talking. And here, this lawyer that is well-known in this area, and who you know and how long you've been here means a lot in this area, and he stands before the judge like a little puppy dog. And he says, Your Honor, my client here, he, he, he really didn't realize how fast he was going. And uh, without saying all the reasons why, he had a very good purpose for why he was going as, as fast as he was. And I would really like to ask if you could see it in your heart to maybe just allow him to go to driving school. Uh, please just allow that to be. And, I, would you just allow him to go to driving school and just pay the fine here? Would you please do that? And I thought, first of all, you're supposed to be the guy in these parts. Why are you acting like a little whipped puppy before the judge? And it was for good reason, because the judge saw him do that, and he said, okay, Craig, because you've said that, we'll allow that to take place. And afterwards, he said, you have to conduct yourself in a humble, right way before the judge. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how long I've been practicing. He said he could easily just decide on a whim to send you to jail if he wanted. And so we have to approach the right way. A couple of other occasions where I've had some, some tickets. I've gone before the judge myself, and I've stood before him, and I have done the exact same thing. But every time I go in saying to myself, I know what I'm going to tell him. 
and it will let me completely off. But then you see the black robe, and you see the mahogany, and the people in court, and all the people who've gone before you who have just gotten read the riot act, and you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to make sure that I'm very proper and on my best behavior. I'll just accept guilt, and I'll take the ticket. Now, as fearful as we might be before a human judge, can I just say something? Understand that one day you're going to stand before the God of heaven and earth. And that should be humbling to all of us. To know that we will stand before the only true righteous judge that has ever lived, God. And we will give an account for what we have done or what we haven't done. And at that point in time, you can't hire a heavenly lawyer to, to stand in for you. Michael the archangel, I'm sure, is great, but he's not going to come in and be your representative. You're going to stand before God yourself, and we will give an answer for what we've done. Now, it's far better if we're saved in that moment as opposed to not saved. That makes all the difference. I hope that you know for certain that you've trusted in Jesus Christ and that if you were to die today, heaven would be your home. By that I mean you've recognized yourself as a sinner, you've confessed that before God, and you've said, Lord, I, I acknowledge my sin before you. I'm confessing that, but I'm asking you to save me and to give me a home in heaven for all of eternity. And I'm inviting you into my life. I want to have a relationship with you. If you do that, our God is loving and he is forgiving and he will have a relationship with you, and he'll give you a home in heaven for all of eternity. Praise the Lord for that. But it will be very different if you stand before God, having never received him. Don't make that mistake. Everyone will face the Lord in judgment. Now, here's the second thought. There will be a clear distinction that is made. And I've already spoken to this, but just as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats so will the Lord divide the saved from the unsaved. During that seven-year period of time, there will be people that are saved out of that. There will be others who will receive the mark of the beast. They'll reject the Lord, and they will not be saved. This is the only distinction about us that truly matters in eternity. And so be sure that you belong to God. I'm not trying to be purposely scary this morning, but I just want to be honest. It is a fearful thing to stand before an almighty God and to not know that you are saved and to not be sure that you've ever received him. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15 says this, <coughs> and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So there will be a reckoning day at that great white throne judgment that's for all those at the end of the millennial reign of Christ who have rejected the Lord. And if their name is not found written in the book of life, they will be condemned to hell for all of eternity. Now that's what the Bible tells us. The Bible actually speaks about names being blotted out blotted out of the book of life. You know what I believe? And this is just the book of Hastings, chapter 1 and verse 1. I believe that everyone's name begins in that book. I believe everyone's name starts out in that book of life. But when a person dies without receiving Christ and they die dead in their trespasses and sins, that's when their name gets blotted out. But if you receive the Lord, your name is there, it stays there, and it will never be blotted out. But mark it down, there's a book. It's the book of life. And your name is either there, or one day it'll be blotted out if we die in our trespasses and sins. Don't make that mistake. I know I'm making a plea for salvation here, and my hope and prayer is that you know the Lord. But if you don't, I, I can't stress how important this is Nothing else in life matters compared to this. You must know where your eternity lies. There's, there's a lot that we don't know about our future. We don't know if we will pull out on Lee Davis Road and be smashed by a vehicle and enter into eternity. 
Just a year ago, there was a fella right out here on a motorcycle, right in that neighborhood, right there. And he pulled out, he didn't see a vehicle coming, he got hit full force, thrown off the motorcycle, right at the entrance of this neighborhood, right here, he was, he was dead instantly. We had just come here for our Wednesday night service, and we uh, gathered around, and there he, there he was, and the ambulances were there, and it was a tough scene. But even in a nice little place like this, people are killed all the time. We don't know what our future holds. You don't know what's down the road for you. Uh, you can be killed right on Lee Davis Road. You can be killed going into the military and being, you know, shipped overseas. We're praying for Trent, and he's about to go to the military. We don't know what his future holds. We don't know what your future holds. None of us know what is ahead for us. But here's what we do know. If our faith is in Jesus Christ, our eternity is sealed. We know that our home is there and that the Lord Jesus Christ is ours. Nothing can take that away. Once you've trusted in Jesus Christ, your name will never be blotted out, and you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Once you are saved, you are always saved, and nothing can change that. Here's the third and final thought. And this is important. Our actions toward others often reveal our position. Our action towards others often reveal our position. It's interesting what Jesus the King is going to say to those at this judgment of the nations. He's going to separate the saved and the unsaved. He uses a farming term because they would understand that, sheep and goats. Goats are kind of ugly anyway, right? He's going to separate those two, and he's going to say to them some certain things. To those during the tribulation who did believe and who were saved, and they're going to be saved in the same way any of us are saved, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, by not receiving the mark of the beast, he's going to say some specific things. He's going to say, For I was in hunger and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Notice, those who come to a saving faith during the tribulation will refuse the mark of the beast and they will greatly help the least of God's people. Now, this is not teaching a works-based salvation. We have to understand that. There's nothing we can do to ever save ourselves. However, it's very revealing the way we treat and conduct ourselves towards other people, especially God's people, it's very revealing about where we are and about whether we are a sheep or a goat. In other words, whether we are saved or unsaved. In other words, our conduct towards God but also towards others reveals oftentimes our spiritual condition. And I want us just to consider for a moment, what is our spiritual condition? Because in the time of the tribulation, those who are saved not only refuse the mark of the beast, but they greatly help others who are saved and hurting and not being fed and they need help right where they are. They, they put action to what they say. By the way, I love the fact that we do Operation Christmas Child. I used to have this mindset, well, you know, the gospel's enough. Just give them the gospel, that's what they need, and that'll change your life. And that's true. But the Lord never says in his word that we can't sweeten the pot. As a matter of fact, when the Lord witnessed to all those people, the 5,000 plus, he broke bread and fish and he fed them all. It's smart for us to sweeten the pot to give a Christmas to a child who needs to be saved, but on top of that, then to give the gospel, to meet people where they are, to see what the need is, not just to give a gospel card to someone at a Christmas parade, but to give them a candy cane with it, to do anything we can to help people to receive the truth is wise, so long as we're not compromising our convictions or the word of God. 
And so that's what the Lord is saying. I, I noticed that you did something. You took care of the least of my people. You not only have loved me, but you have loved others. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 says this, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Verse 39 says this, And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You can say all day long that you love the Lord, but you demonstrate that by how you treat your neighbor, namely the people of God and then the people in this world. Can I ask you a question? Do you like coming to church? Do you like being around God's people? I, I've got to be honest. I am greatly confused by people who claim to love and know God who don't like people, especially God's people. Do you know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying you have to be the biggest extrovert there is. I'm not saying you have to be, you know, Mr. Personality or Mrs. Personality. Some people are not naturally that way. But if you don't have at least a desire and are making an effort to be around God's people and to be around others and to want to share the truth with others and to want to help uh, those who are especially of the household of faith and you're doing what you can to love people and be there for people and, and, and be surrounded with people and to get together with people, I am concerned about your salvation. I'm not declaring whether or not you're saved. I don't know the hearts. Only God does. And by the way, aren't you thankful for that? I'm glad I can't tell who is or is not saved. But I get concerned and worried about people who don't like people and want nothing to do with people. That's not the heart of Jesus Christ. God did not call us to be a bunch of recluses. He did not call us to kind of go into our holes and only come out when we have to go to work and when we have to go to school and Otherwise, I'm shut off from everybody else. God has called us into community. You know what Jesus did while he was here on this earth? Every time I read about him, he's with others. And when he is by himself, he's praying to the Father. That's our example. And can I say, so can I say something? That some of you need to open up your homes. Some of you need to open up your hearts. Some of you need to have a greater heart for people than you've ever had because you've become too withdrawn and you've become too insular. When the Lord goes through that judgment of the nations, he recognizes and he calls out those people who fed others, who clothed others, who were with others, and at that judgment, they're even initially surprised. They're, Lord, how did we do this? We didn't know this was what you did. He said, oh, you did it to me because you did it to the least of my brethren. And I saw that. And I noticed that. There should be no more loving people than the people right here at Truth Baptist Church. We should welcome people with open arms. We should let people know that we're not just on the surface being nice, but we're really trying to help people where they are. Clear aside your schedule. Work some time into your schedule to be with people. Love people, because the Lord says, if you love me, you'll love others, and that'll be seen in how you treat people. Can I tell you something? If we all had that approach, if we all had that approach, you know what would happen? Uh, I, in no time, we would have to have a second service here. I think we're already kind of close to that. We're pretty full in here, and we got a whole full lobby, so that's exciting, amen? amen? But we could have a second service like that if we all had that approach. Let's love God. Let's love others. I get it. People sometimes frustrate us. By the way, you frustrate a lot of people, too. You know how I know? because I'm the number one frustrator of almost everyone who knows me. <laughs> People are frustrated. Don't anyone say amen right there? I heard someone try to say something. I understand. People are difficult. People make 
life hard. People sometimes can complicate our life. But that's what God has called us to. If you want to love him, love others. And you will show the love of Jesus Christ by doing that. It's time to open your home. It's time to open your wallet. It's time to get together. It's time to show people how much you care because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I'm simply saying this. God has called us into community. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And then he talks to those who rejected him and they did just the opposite. They only cared about themselves, getting that mark, making sure they were taken care of and not worrying a thing about others. You don't know a great retirement plan? Invest in people. You might say, well, I got to get my 401k. I got to make sure I got my RRA. And, I gotta, and, and there might be something to all of those. But just invest in people because you might have some full bank accounts at the end of your life. And then you might get something where you need someone else and you'll have no one else. I'm simply saying... Let, let's prioritize what the Lord has prioritized. Let's make people our priority. Let's understand that our actions toward others often reveal our position. It's time to start loving people. It's time to start helping people. This is convicting to me because I'm not always a loving guy. I want to be. Sometimes I can be a downright mean person. I don't want to be anymore. And where I am, I want to repent of it and make it right. And, and, and you know something? God's forgiving and God's gracious. He doesn't expect us to have it all right all the time. But I hope I come to the end of my days as an adult man, a much better man than where I started. I want to be a sweet-spirited, loving grandpa where all the grandkids and everyone wants to come be around. I don't want to be that bitter old man that no one wants anything to do with. Let's strive to be like Christ. Amen? Would you pray with me, heads bowed and eyes closed? Father, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you for this day being together here. Lord, I ask that you would use this message in a, in a powerful way. I want to reflect you. However, I've not always done that. And I think there's been moments in my life where I've been more like the goats described here than the sheep. Lord, help us to be the sheep that God has claimed us to be. Help us to be sweet-spirited. Help us to be Christ-like. Help us to come to the end of our life loving you and loving others. That really matters. That means so much. Help us now in this moment of invitation. Speak to our hearts, I pray. If there might be somebody here, Father, who's never been saved, I pray that they would make that decision today. And maybe if you are here and you've never trusted in Christ, would you do so now? Why don't you call upon the Lord? You can do so in the quietness of your seat with heads bowed and eyes closed. Simply say this to the Lord. Say, dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I'm confessing my sin before you. Please forgive me. Come into my life. I believe that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and risen again. Help me now to live for you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder, might there be somebody with a raised hand who said, Pastor, I just prayed that. I won't call you out. Or you might say, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer. I just trusted in Jesus Christ. If you are saved, listen, let's start loving and living like Jesus Christ. In the end, that's what he values. At this judgment, he's going to call out those who have lived and loved like he did. Let's make that a priority in the time that we have left. Father, thank you for this time together. Speak to our hearts. Thank you for your love now. Have your way in this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name.
Amen. Would you quietly stand to your feet, please, with heads bowed and with eyes closed? Just stay put. Don't go anywhere. We have a couple things we want to do at the end of this invitation, but right now, I'm going to ask that Holly would play a verse or two of invitation. As she does, would you, would you respond? Would you come? Would you pray? Let's bring something before the Lord this morning, whatever it might be. And please be seated if you would. I want to just do a couple things. First of all, while I was preaching and looking out, I always surveyed the congregation. That's good to know, by the way. I know if you're sleeping. I know if you're scowling. <laughs> but I see everyone's face. I do look, too. But as I was looking out, I see Darlene that's here. And um, she does not want me to do this. But Darlene, would you please just stand up? Just stand up. Yes, just stand up. Yes, yes. All right, go like this. Put your hand up. Come on. There we go. There she is. I call her out for this reason. Um, many of you have not met Darlene, but she is uh, what has been for a long time the, one of the directors at, or the director at Christian Village. And it was Darlene when I preached and asked uh, a group of ladies about five years ago to be praying that we would get our own church building that she called her pastor to come over and meet me. And from that prayer request, at the end of that message that I was preaching, her pastor, E.L. Jones, showed up. And, uh, and he and I talked, and he said, I hear you're looking for a church building. I said, yes. He said, we're looking to sell one. Not a lot of people know about that right, right now. And, uh, and so he brought me over here and showed me the building. And really, the rest was history, to be honest. The Lord just, through that whole situation, put that together. And uh, I just... Um, the reason I called Darlene out like that, she said she was going to visit here just to show up. And, and her da- There's a couple of things about her that are very special. First of all, her dad built this building. So that's incredibly neat just to say that. They had a birthday party for him last year. Was he 90? Had his 90th birthday down in, you know, they were able to use the downstairs. She said, can we use it for his birthday party? I said, yes. <laughs> he built the building. I think he can do that. But I'm always thankful for the way the Lord used Darlene uh, just to be able to be, be a tool in the Lord's hands to have us get this building. What a neat thing. And, uh, and she didn't know. She just wanted to say, okay, look, if they've been, she knew we were looking for a building for a long time and just made that phone call. I will always, I will always be thankful that you called your pastor to come and that I got a chance to meet him. And that now, because of that, we're in this building. I mean, that is just an incredible story, but it's only the grace of God that allowed that to happen. So um, don't let her escape before you say hi to her. And thank you for being here. Her husband's here as well. And uh, so thankful to have you two with us. I just, I didn't see you earlier, but I saw you while I was preaching. So I wanted to say that. All right. The other part of this is Trent, we want to pray over you. He's getting ready to go to the army. And uh, if you don't mind, Trent, would you come on up? I just want to pray with you up front. Uh, Trent's been by my side since day one, and uh, and he didn't have a choice in the matter, but he came when he was two years old, 
And whether it was knocking on doors or whether it was meeting people and giving the gospel, hours and hours of setting up chairs, breaking down chairs, whatever it was I asked him to do, he was right there by my side doing it. And that means a lot. It means a lot to a dad. It means a lot to a pastor. And I'm so thankful for him. I'm thankful that he's going to the army and following God's will. So, excuse me. (laughs) Uh, But let me have a word of prayer with him. And then we'll close. Lord, we thank you for Trent. We thank you that he's taken this step. We thank you that he's going to the army and going to go to boot camp and going to just follow uh, what you want him to do. I pray that you'd be with him. I pray for protection over him. Lord, not just physically, but uh, mentally and spiritually. Lord, we pray that your hand would be on him. And Lord, I pray that you would direct his steps. And uh, we love him so much. And I pray that you would use him. And uh, use him to be a light, use him to be an encouragement to those he'll be in boot camp with and those that he'll come in contact with during his time in. Uh, May he be strong, but may he be fully relying upon you And uh, so we just ask all these things uh, in your precious and holy name. We pray that you would uh, be with us, be with us as a church family. So many here in this church family have loved him really like their own son. And they didn't have to do that, but they've treated him like a son. Others have treated him like a brother or like an older brother. So many young people have looked up to him for so long and we just we want your very best for his life and we ask that you would guide him now as he goes we do thank you and we love you in jesus name we pray amen Amen. all right now that i've done that let's all stand together and be dismissed take a moment and let trent know you're praying for him and uh say hi to darlene and others good to see kendall here good to see Spencer, and what's your friend's name again? Rob, Spencer and Rob, and wish them well for the rest of their semester, and so many others. And uh, we'll be dismissed now in a word of prayer. Pop, would you dismiss us, please?